Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the first program on the first day of Reptile and Amphibian Days. My name is Martha Fisk, and I am an educator with the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. And we are so excited that you could join us today for our kickoff program. I am joined by Dr. Brian Stewart, our curator of research or our research curator of herpetology. And today he's gonna to give us a behind the scenes tour of the herpetology research collection. And so while you are joining, we would love to hear from you. So where are you joining from? Have you attended reptile and amphibian days before? Do you have a favorite reptile or amphibian that you would like to type into the chat? So while we are learning more about our museum's herpetology collection, we would love to have your questions and comments. And at the very end, we will make sure we leave plenty of time to let Dr. Brian Stewart answer those for you. So with that, I am going to hand it over to Brian Stewart. Thanks so much for joining us today. Hello, thank you, Martha, and, and welcome everyone to Reptile and Amphibian Days. This is my very favorite event of the year. I missed you all last year. I'm so sorry we couldn't get together. And I wish we could be together in person this year uh, rather than virtual, but um, I'm going to do the best I can by seizing an opportunity to share with you a behind the scenes look into the herpetology research collection at the museum. Now, <clears throat> when most of you think of the Museum of Natural Sciences uh, in downtown, you think of our buildings, our wonderful buildings, our facilities, our exhibits, our, uh, our interactive labs and so forth that are in downtown Raleigh, North Carolina. And uh, I hope you've all had a chance to visit us or will at some point in the future. And this is where we usually get together for Reptile and Amphibian Day. Um, but because we had to do this virtually, I'm going to take you to a very special place that's not quite as impressive from the outside <clears throat> as our beautiful downtown museum buildings. Uh, but rather, I'm going to take you to an off-site facility, uh, the Fluid Collection Facility that belongs to the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. And although it's unremarkable from the outside, on the inside, it houses a fantastic natural history library. And these are our preserved research collections of specimens that are typically kept in fluid preservatives. Uh, and these include invertebrates, fishes, and of course, amphibians and reptiles. Uh, and I have the privilege of being in charge of the herpetology research collection at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. Now it's not open to the public uh, because th these are working research specimens that are housed in this specialized working laboratory facility that was designed for housing thousands and thousands of gallons of preservatives, primarily uh, ethyl alcohol and formalin. Um, and so I'm going to give you a walk through these collections uh, and try and share with you how incredibly invaluable these are for research and conservation. And so this herpetology research collection at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences contains nearly 300,000 preserved specimens of amphibians and reptiles that date back to the mid 1800s. And so this is a collection uh, of amphibians and reptiles from across North Carolina, across the Southeastern US uh, and selected parts of the world. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, that given the history of these collections represent uh, uh, what species used to occur where across this landscape. And each one of these specimens uh, in this collection uh, is individually tagged uh, with a unique number. 
that uh, is used to always associate that specimen with its data, who collected that specimen, where it was collected, and so forth. And so you can imagine with this many preserved specimens uh, from all across North Carolina, the Southeastern US and other parts of the world, we have documented the existence of species of amphibians and reptiles uh, in places where either they were never known to occur before and unfortunately, where they're not known to occur now because of all the significant modifications that humans have made to, to these landscapes. So we just have this incredible time series of what species occurred where. And these collections, which consist of, as I mentioned, preserved specimens that uh, are originally uh, fixed, uh, usually in formalin, and then are stored uh, permanently uh, in, in usually an ethyl alcohol, um, uh, as well as other materials such as skins these, and skeletons. These are skeletons of hellbender salamanders. Uh, and the idea is some of these specimens are already more than 150 years old. And so we care for these specimens in a manner with a hope that these will last indefinitely into the future. And so these collection facilities uh, have a, uh, are kept maintained at a constant temperature, at a constant humidity. We care for the specimens, but we have special covers over our, over our UV lights to prevent UV light degradation and so forth. Um, and anyway, so as I was mentioning, in addition to having actually the specimens, we have these associated data that are so critically important with these specimens, such as who collected them, where they were collected and so forth. And historically, what we have always done is record uh, you know, all those data in a handwritten ledger. Uh, and in the past, um, these were typed onto cards, almost like a library card. And one could, could, could flip through these, uh, through the ledgers or these card catalogs and retrieve all of our records of what species we would have or all of our records from a particular county in North Carolina. Um, and today in the research collection, we spend a huge amount of effort trying to digitize all those invaluable data that are associated with these specimens and get them into our online collection. So if you have never visited our online collections, I would encourage you to go to the museum's website, naturalsciences.org and visit our online collections. And in those um, online collections, you can learn details about what we have in our research collections, not just for amphibians and reptiles, but for all of the museum's collections, including geology and paleontology, birds and mammals, uh, fishes and vertebrates and so forth. And in the case of our amphibian and reptile database, you can go in and you can look up a species and you can see what we have and you can map its geographic, map the distribution of where our specimens come. And then you can click on each little record and learn when and where it was collected and so forth. And these um, specimens are used for a whole variety of purposes. Um, most of the collection is used to document uh, the presence of a species at a particular time and place, but also used for I, uh, taxonomy. So species identifications. So these specimens are often, most often used to look at variation within and among populations to decide if this population is the same species as another species, as another population. And that's called taxonomy, the art of naming, describing species. Um, but these collections are used for a whole variety of things. And every time I think that, uh, you know, uh, the, the, all of the potential uses for these collections have been exhausted, we get a new request from a researcher uh, to use our research collections uh, for something else. These collections are used for research, not just in taxonomy, but also in systematics, um, re reconstructing evolutionary relationships of species, 
Um, they're used for understanding the natural history and biology of these species. These specimens, they're, they're cut open. People look inside their stomachs to see what they've been eating. They look at um, um, their, their reproductive system and understand reproductive cycles in specimens. Uh, they look at uh, uh, they'll, they'll do histology of, of bones, for example, and look at growth rates for species. Um, and often these specimen collections are used for very fundamentally important things like field guides um, for illustrating uh, what species look like and where they occur. And so these, our research collections are available um, for uh, um, researchers and uh, 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 conservation managers, anybody who has a legitimate need to use these collections or the data that are associated with these collections, those data about when and where these individuals were, were collected and so forth that verify the geographic ranges uh, uh, of these species. All of these, these, the specimens and the data themselves are available um, for researchers to come and use free of charge here at the museum if they have a legitimate need uh, to do so. And so we often, well, in the pre-COVID era, would regularly host visitors to our uh, uh, research collection facility and people will, will spend days going through our collections and measuring and photographing specimens and so forth. We also have a very active loan program uh, and ship our specimens um, to researchers all around the world who have a legitimate need to borrow them uh, for research purposes. And so now I wanna take you into the range. This is the herpetology collection range. On the right side are the amphibians and on the left side are the reptiles. And they're organized, uh, what we say it's phylogenetically by the evolutionary relationship. Uh, and then they are, um, alphabetized, I'm sorry, they're, they're, they're organized by order and by family, by their evolutionary relationship. And then within a family, they're organized on shelves by the genus and species. Those are the scientific names um, alphabetically. And then within a species, they're organized uh, usually by, by region. Uh, and that allows us to go in and be able to find specimens, much like a, like a library. In, in, in some ways, we have so much material um, that it's really, really important to keep things well organized. Now, where do these specimens come from? We, we off, very often get that question. And, um, and so I want to tell you hist historically, um, this collection was built by museum scientists and other researchers who would go out uh, into the field uh, to document what species were occurring and they would collect some representative individuals and preserve them and house them in our collections. And today we do sometimes do targeted collecting. Uh, for example, if there's a new county record for a particular species, we might collect a voucher and so forth. But most of the material specimens that come into our collections today are what we call salvage specimens. So unfortunately, road mortality is a real problem for amphibians and reptiles. As you've all seen, uh, in turtles and snakes and, and other amphibians and reptiles are routinely, unfortunately, run over by cars. Uh, and we, so we try to make the best of a bad situation. And we spend a lot of time uh, picking up roadkill specimens of amphibians and reptiles today uh, and salvaging them repairing those that are in good condition and preserving them into specimens. So while we do do some targeted collecting here in the state today for specific projects or to, or to make, to document um, a particularly important range extension or something like that, um, most of what we're getting in today is road killed uh, or other salvage specimens from the state. Um, but we have a long and important history of discovery of amphibians and reptiles, both here in the state uh, and around the world. And I wanna share some of those stories with you. Uh, this is always a favorite. And this is one of my, usually one of my first stops. Uh, it's both, it's right at the front of the, of the collection range as you enter it um, coming in. Um, and uh, it's such a, such a important part of our 
both our collections history and the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences histories. So behind me, these are preserved specimens of Noose River water dogs, Nectaris lewisi is the scientific name. And this is a species that occurs only in the Noose and Tar River drainages of North Carolina. And it was originally described to science in 1924 by C.S. Brimley, who was one of the founders of the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences and who had a particular interest in herpetology, the study of amphibians and reptiles. And our museum founder, C.S. Brimley, named the species after the Raleigh fisherman, whose name was Lewis, who brought in the first specimens to the museum back in the 1920s from the Noose River uh, near, near Raleigh. And so C.S. Brimley described uh, the species as a new species to science, and he, uh, let's see, let me move. Whoops, as a new species to science. Uh, and um, we have very, very important documentation of, of this species. And so, in many ways, the Noose River water dog, a beautiful, uh, beautiful, large, it's, it gets about, oh, six or eight inches long found only in the Noose and Tar River drainages, fully aquatic, those are its big bushy gills, um, is really one of our special quote unquote backyard species. It's endemic, found only in North Carolina and uh, was originally discovered right here in Raleigh by our, and described by our museum founder. And uh, even more recently, uh, my colleagues at the museum and I uh, started going through and looking at variation among specimens of two-line salamanders. Now these two-line salamanders, these are a very common species. Many of you might even have two-line salamanders in, in little streams in your neighborhoods or in your backyards. Um, it's a very, very abundant complex of species in Eastern North America. And so my colleagues and I started going through and looking at variation in two line salamanders specimens in our collection. And, oops, let me move. And uh, taking specimens and uh, digitizing, imaging them, and taking detailed measurements from them. And by doing so, we were able to verify that there is a species of salamander now named the Carolina Sandhill salamander and here it is in life, um, that we just described the science as a new species in December of 2020. And the Carolina Sandhills salamander is found only in the Sandhills physiographic region of North Carolina. Um, and we have in our collections, uh, most of the known specimens of these, of these salamanders. And some of these um, specimens go back uh, even to the 1960s uh, in our collection. So even though specimens have been in collections for a long time, uh, by revisiting them and using new techniques to understand variation, and in this case, we also, uh, a critical component was looking at genetic variation uh, from these museum specimens, we can learn about so much hidden diversity right in, in our own collections. And then one of my very favorite parts in the collection range is the types cabinet. So after this, a new species is described. So in this case, we named the Carolina Sandhill salamander. Uh, we designate one specimen to be what is called the holotype specimen. And the holotype specimen is the name bearing specimen. So this is almost like the standard for the species, much as there's a standard kilogram uh, housed in Paris, uh, we, when a scientist describes a new species, he or she will select a specimen and say, this is the name bearing specimen that represents the concept that I'm in, intending the species to be. And so here's our holotype specimen. And you can imagine uh, being the standard bearer for the species. That's a very, very important specimen. And so we call those type specimens. And we have a cabinet 
This is a, a super fireproof, concrete lined, uh, weighs about 700 pounds, this cabinet, uh, that we keep locked and it houses our type specimens. And these are the specimens when somebody's gonna describe a new species in a group, these are what people really wanna look, wanna go back in the past. And if somebody were to say, for example, to go back to, to describe a new species of, uh, of water dog, uh, and they need to understand what really was Brimley's concept of a Noose River water dog, or what really did these researchers mean by the Carolina Sandhill salamander? They would go into our types cabinet and look at our type specimens uh, of, of these species. And, um, and as such, we take really, really good care of our type specimens, keep them all locked up. Um, and unfortunately, it, it creates a huge problem when a type specimen is lost um, because uh, then, and then it becomes unclear exactly what that researcher had intended with, with that name. And so for example, unfortunately, many, many of the early type specimens are, are housed in, in uh, Western Europe. And unfortunately, many of those type specimens were lost during World War II when several important museums were, were bombed during World War II. And even today, researchers are still going back and trying to um, understand uh, what was meant and trying to designate a new type specimen to replace those that are lost. They're just so incredibly important. And I love to show people these jars on our shelf in their collection. So these are preserved specimens of Eastern coral snakes. And they serve as a wonderful example of how important and invaluable these historical museum specimens are. So Eastern coral snakes uh, occur here in North Carolina. We're at the very Northern limit of their range. Um, and today they're found only in the extreme Southeastern part of the state. However, if you go into our herpetology research collections, you will find Eastern coral snakes much further to the west in North Carolina in that Sand Hills physiographic region, that same part of North Carolina where from which the Carolina, Carolina Sand Hills salamander uh, was recently described as a new species. And so back in the 1920s and 1930s, all the way up until the 1960s, we have pre preserved specimens of Eastern coral snakes from the Sand Hills of North Carolina. And a coral snake has not been seen from the sand hills, the western part uh, of its former range in North Carolina since the 1960s. And so recently some researchers used all of our records of coral snakes. And by looking at um, past geographic distributions and present geographic distributions and using some modeling and uh, in, in, in creating uh, in what's called environmental niche modeling, uh, ecological niche modeling, excuse me, they created a environmental envelope around where that species occurred. And by doing so, they were able to show that the decline, disappearance of the Eastern coral snake from the Western part of its range in North Carolina was most likely due to climate change, even just in the past 50 years. And so our collections, they're, not, they're used to understand past geographic distributions of species, current geographic distributions of species. Uh, and in, in cases like this, like uh, um, ecological niche modeling, they can be used to project future geographic distributions of species under different climate scenarios, for example. But in any case, I'm so glad that we have, it's so unfortunate that we've lost the coral snake from that part of its range uh, in North Carolina, but I'm so for it's so fortunate that we have these preserved specimens of a coral snake. Now, coral snakes, um, beautiful animal. They are venomous, but secretive and very, very rare. And being a venomous species, they have several harmless uh, species that mimic uh, mimic them. And so, this is an example of a species. This is a scarlet king snake which occurs here in North Carolina as well. And it's a harmless species that mimics the venomous Eastern coral snake. And today, scarlet king snakes are still found in the sandhills of North Carolina. 
And so if we didn't have these preserved specimens of coral snakes from the sand hills, we might just look back in somebody's field notebooks, their observations, their publications, and somebody might have said, well, I saw a coral snake in the sand hills way back when. And we would probably, given that they don't occur there today, probably just assume that what they observed was just a, was they had confused uh, their observation with a harmless mimic, such as perhaps a, a scarlet king snake. But by having these specimens, we can verify that indeed that species occurred there, and those are accurate identifications. Now, I'd mentioned early on that we get so much salvage roadkill. And usually we just try to repair the specimens that, 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 that are found as roadkill uh, and that are in good condition and that we can, we can, we can um, rehabilitate into a, into a nice museum specimen. But so much valuable information comes from these unfortunate situations of road killed animals. This doesn't look like much, looks kind of gross, I guess, but this is actually a mimic glass lizard. So a mimic glass lizard what is a species that occurs here in North Carolina. It's down, it's a, it's a coastal, coastal plain species uh, that extends all the way down into, into Florida, but it was originally described by a former herpetology curator named Bill Palmer uh, here at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. Now the mimic glass lizard is extremely rare in its range and they're very, very rarely turned up. Um, it, and Recently, um, some colleagues found a road killed specimen down uh, in the Croatan National Forest. And although it was in very, very poor condition, we took that specimen and we're gonna save it as a voucher because we see so few mimic glass lizards today in North Carolina. And we removed pieces of it to preserve for genetic analysis. So even though this specimen is not in very good condition, we are able to preserve pieces of it for future genetic analysis. And that brings us to uh, another really critically important part of the herpetology research collection at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. And those are our genetic resources. So what you're looking at here is the herpetology, well, you can see three ultra cold freezers. And that first one is the herpetology ultra cold freezer. So that's at minus 80 Celsius, which is about minus 115 Fahrenheit or so. So very, 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 very cold. And we keep these ultra cold freezers uh, on double backup. There's a CO2 tank um, that, that is used in case of a mechanical failure. And then these are on generator backup in case of a power failure because they house such critically important genetic resources. So whenever we have a specimen coming into the museum today, we'll remove a little piece of it place it into a vial and store it in our ultra cold freezer so that we'll have the whole preserved voucher in the collection and the genetic uh, tissue for analysis. And so researchers today, when they borrow our specimens, they'll also often borrow a little tiny piece of tissue that has been specially preserved and stored in our ultra cold freezer uh, for genetic analysis. Um, and so this is what it looks like when you open up the freezer, you see there are these, these drawers and then each one of these shelves has a box and each one of these boxes holds lots of these little vials, tissue vials, just like I showed you with that tissue we recently preserved from that mimic glass lizard. Now I mentioned to you that, you know, we, our collection of course is, 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 strongest in North Carolina herpetology, being the state museum. And we are now one of the, the largest and strongest collections in herpetology in the Southeastern United States. But we also have some really, really important collections of amphibians and reptiles from around the world. And in much of my own research, um, not only do I have the privilege of being able to work on the wonderful herpetology of North Carolina, but I also work in Southeast Asia. And here's a photograph of my, my colleagues uh, in Cambodia on the last field trip I was able to make before COVID. Um, and I just wanna show you, um, in this case, what we're trying to do is inventory the amphibians and reptiles 
on a mountain in Cambodia uh, that is very poorly known for amphibians and reptiles. So in this case, we're trying to do general inventories, uh, try to find as many different species as we can find, and to collect a few representatives um, to serve as vouchers for that species. And so uh, this, is, this is my tent in our little field camp in Cambodia on that last trip. And you can see those little red boxes behind me. Uh, that's our little table in our field camp uh, where we'll preserve um, some representative individuals of the species that we find uh, to bring back to the museum for study. Let's see if this works. Here's just a picture of, 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 of our field camp. Uh, I'm sorry, a video of our field camp uh, in, in pouring rain. So what a beautiful, beautiful place that was. And what we do is we set up camp and then we go out and search. And we turn, turn logs and we go up streams at night with headlamps and look in vegetation and look under, under, under structure and find things like this. What is that? That is a Sicilian. A Sicilian is a limbless amphibian. So it's one of the three groups of living amphibians. You're all familiar with the frogs and toads as group one. You're familiar with the salamanders and newts as group two. And then group three are these guys. These are the Sicilians, which are um, the, uh, uh, which are a, a, a tropical group of amphibians. We don't have any here in North Carolina but they're totally limbless. They look almost like worms or eels, but they're an amphibian. In fact, this is the closest relative to salamanders, closest living relative to salamanders. And uh, they're very poorly known because they live in tropical areas of the world. And while some are aquatic, most of them are what we call fossorial, meaning that they burrow. Um, and so here we got very lucky. This is, I believe the fifth specimen ever seen of the cardamom Sicilian which is uh, found only in, in this um, mountain range where we were working in, in Cambodia. Um, so, and whoops, this kind of got cut off a little bit, but what I wanted to, to show you was, um, sorry that got cut off a little bit, but this is just a, a great story of how we use our collections. As I wrap up here, um, my colleagues and I were working on a neighboring mountain area in Southern Vietnam um, a few years ago. And we went there um, hoping to see this frog with that beautiful uh, scarlet uh, scleral arc, we call it, that, that sort of crescent moon shaped um, red coloration on the back of the, on the, on the back uh, the side of the eyeball of this frog. And um, this was a frog that had been described from this mountain in Southern Vietnam, the, the Long Bien Plateau. Uh, many, many years ago, back in the 1920s. And when we did field work there, we were so pleased to see it in life again, but it was living alongside this thing, another species in the same genus, and they were found right together on the same streams on the Long Bien Plateau. But this one had, rather than having a red eye with that sort of moon-shaped, crescent-shaped um, um, coloration on the back of the eye, this one had white eyes that covered basically the upper half uh, of, the, of the iris. And we were very confused because we thought, well, Malcolm Smith, who went up here and described in the 1920s, um, he didn't have the opportunity to, to provide color photographs of these animals. And we wondered, wait a minute, there are two species of frogs in this group living together in this area where Malcolm Smith had visited which one is the named one and which one is the undescribed one. And so we had the opportunity of going into the preserved research collections at the Natural History Museum of London and looking at the original preserved specimen of the species that Malcolm Smith had described from that mountain. And here's the type specimen. And we could, we're able to see that although, although the coloration has faded in preservative, we were able to see that that original type specimen had that crescent uh, shaped eye coloration. And so we were able to conclude that 
the species that Malcolm Smith had described from the Long Bean Plateau in the 1920s belonged to this form. And this form was a new species, which we have described uh, as a new species. And the type specimen is now housed in our types cabinet uh, and is available for research uh, by other researchers. Uh, and in fact, we recently revisited this when we described another species in the same group uh, from Cambodia. So I hope that I have convinced you that these natural history collections of preserved amphibians and reptiles that are housed at the Nat North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences represent an invaluable resource for understanding the biodiversity of amphibians and reptiles here in North Carolina, the Southeastern US uh, and abroad. And with that, I would love to take your questions. Thank you so much. Thanks, Brian. We've got a lot of great questions and comments from everybody. So thank you for typing your questions and sharing in the chat for us. So I will start off earlier, Brian, um, we had some questions about your educational background. So mm -hmm. we have some of our participants today who are interested in learning more about your educational background and your research and how you came to join the museum's team. And then um, I know you talked a little bit about that. And then also, um, does the museum offer research internships for students? So I thought if you could touch on that, that'd be great. And we have some of those links we can share in the chat as well. Okay, well, my background, you know, I have, so one can't go out and get a degree in herpetology. So herpetology is the study of the biology of amphibians and reptiles. So I have degrees in biology. And as you advance uh, through uh, your graduate studies, you become more and more specialized in the topic. And as I did so, I became more and more specialized in amphibians and reptiles. So I have an undergraduate degree in biology from Cornell. And then I did my master's in zoology at NC State and my PhD at the University of Illinois and the Field Museum in a joint program in Chicago. And then I did a postdoc at the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology at Berkeley. And I was hired in 2008 um, to be the herpetology curator here at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences uh, when our former curator, Alvin Braswell, who's now a retired emeritus curator, uh, at that time he had moved uh, into administration uh, at the museum. And, um, you know, I, in my background, I, when, I was, when I was young, um, I was really into birds. And I thought, you know, if, if I'm going to be an ornithologist, and I thought at the time, well, if one wants to be an ornithologist, they should go to Cornell because of its wonderful Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology, which had made such an impression on me as a, as a youngster. And so I went to Cornell, and indeed it's a wonderful place, but I took a herpetology course. And so that sort of, and I really opened up my eyes to how incredibly wonderful amphibians and reptiles are. And while I still love birds, after all, they are just feathered reptiles. Um, um, I sort of shifted then and became more and more focused on amphibians and reptiles. So, and as for we, you know, as you can imagine, there is a ton of work to do in this collection that ranges both from curation, so taking care of these co collections, to conducting research on these collections, making good use of them. Uh, and so we have been so fortunate to have, you know, in the past, pre-COVID, an army of volunteers uh, and interns who have helped us in all aspects of this, of working with this collection the curatorial side and the research side. Um, and, uh, and so absolutely we depend uh, on, on you know, our wonderful uh, volunteers and interns to help us out with, uh, with these activities. So if that is something you're interested in, things are a little complicated right now, as you can imagine, because of the COVID um, situation. But I would encourage you to look at the links. I believe Martha, you're gonna post some of the links but to visit the museum website and or contact me directly. Thanks, Brian. I was gonna um, kind of make a joke about how if you like birds and 
perps, reptiles, and amphibians when you're hiking around, how do you decide where to look? <laughs> Up, down, all around, uh, right? <laughs> I'm usually looking down now. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, let's see, we have some more questions about the collections. So Heather wanted to know how many species do you have total in our collection? Good question, and we we just recently tallied that up as we were um, and for and this is one of the ways that our database is you know so incredibly useful. But we calculated uh, that we currently have about a thousand seventy species represented in our collection. But actually, that's an underestimate because many of those are what we call species complexes. So we know there's significant morphological variation, variation in the way they look, genetic variation. Um, in some cases, if in case of, for example, frogs, there might be call differences. And so while these are still considered to be a single species, we have lots of undescribed species in our collections. And I share, like some of the examples I shared with you today that remain to be described. So we're aware of undes lots of undescribed species in our collections. And so that 1,070 is, is an underestimate. There's actually a lot more. Mm -hmm. And then you mentioned earlier too that there is some digitization of the specimens. Is there a hope to do the entire collection and have it as a digital record? Ideally, yes. Okay. So we, it's sort of a two-step process for us. Our, our, our big challenge that we're, we're, we're working through now is first digitizing all the data for the specimens. And so, because it's so critically important to have those data quickly accessible um, not just to us, but to you know any researcher or anybody who needs to get those data. And so right now what we're doing is going back and making sure that we're fully digitizing all of the data that are associated with each of those specimens and getting them into our database. But then our next step, we're moving to a new software, database software um, that will allow us in the future to add images of specimens. And that would be fantastic because often having just like an image of the specimen might be all a researcher needs in order to answer one quick question. You know, for example, you could imagine um, how convenient it would have been for me just to be able to quickly take a look at that preserved um, type specimen that's housed in the Natural History Museum of London. Just from images, I can see that see the shape of that coloration in the eye. Um, and so, there's tremendous value in being able to digitize images of the actual specimen. And we are hoping to go that way in the future. Thanks. And then some more follow-up questions about actual jars that you showed and, and what is in them. Katrina noticed that there are multiple tags and some jars and in reference to the coral snakes, how many coral snakes would you fit in a standard jar? It's not just one per jar or more than one? Does it just kind of depend? No, we, we, we have multiple specimens per jar. But usually, the specimen, each specimen is individually tagged. So um, you know, I guess like like this. Um, and while sometimes a specimen might have more than one tag, it might bear, for example, a field tag, which was the tag that was a uh, you know a, a assigned to it when it was collected in the field, and then later the museum catalog tag NCSM number put on it when it arrives at the museum later. Uh, each one is uniquely tagged. Um, there are exceptions to that. Whoops, that's not. There are some exceptions to that um, in cases of things like um, larvae. So, for example, if you have tadpoles, it's very difficult to tie a tag onto a, an individual tadpole, or of course, amphibian eggs or reptile eggs or something like that. Um, in those cases, you might have one number assigned to a group of specimens, and we'll call we call that a lot. L O T a lot of specimens. So that'd be one number that applies to a group of specimens that all share the same data. Um, and then as for, and so because the individuals, um, except for those examples I gave with the larval amphibians and eggs and so forth, um, the because they're individually tagged, the specimens can be housed together. And so we tend to house them together um, once they're individually tagged in whatever way makes the most sense and that conserves space because space is always an issue, of course. 
Um, so in, they might be housed uh, by a jar uh, geographically. So all the specimens from a particular geographic area will be in one jar, or they might be housed in a jar chronologically. So the most recent specimens are added, you know, um, and so the, the, the sort of a time series of, of it, it really depends on what they are, what shape this, the, the specimens are and so forth. So that's a great uh, lead into a follow up question from Katrina about turtles and how you would preserve them. Does their shell make it hard to put, squeeze them into a jar? So, yes. Yeah. Typically preserve turtles and tortoises. Yeah. And so it, it, um, um, it is difficult preserving turtles, um, and unfortunately, we do get quite a few turtles because you know turtles are routinely hit hit by vehicles on and on, on roads, as you know. Um, usually, only small specimens of turtles get preserved and stored in jars. Um, we are able to still um, open up open up the specimen, remove tissue for genetic analysis. And then we inject formalin and so forth into, into, the, uh, into the body. Um, so you can do that even with the shell. Um, it takes a little bit, little bit of work, but you're right. I mean, because of the shell, you, you, you don't have much um, flexibility like a snake. You, can't, you can curl around a jar, but a, a, a turtle shell, no. So usually small turtles are, are housed in jars and then larger turtles are housed in tanks. And I don't know if you can see, I wonder if in one of my pictures, but maybe. Um, you could describe the tank. It's like a big giant rectangle, right? I don't know. Yeah, we it. have these big stainless steel tanks that like hold a, larger specimens. Mm -hmm. Like a sideways refrigerator almost, except the lid opens up and it's filled with liquid, right? Correct, <laughs> yeah. correct. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. So then, um, do we have any Sicilian specimens in our collection? That's what Elena wanted to know. We do have Sicilian specimens, okay. absolutely. Um, we do, uh, and yep, the part of our international holdings. Mm -hmm. And I know that there's venomous specimens in the collection. Um, Rosalind wants to know, do some of these have their poison still? Do they still, that remains part, does it remain intact? Yeah, yeah. I understand. So the question is, you know, is the venom that's inside, say, the venom glands of of the venomous species of snakes, is it still um, potentially viable? You know, could could I be handling one of these specimens and 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 catch my finger on the fang and and be injected with venom? And, and the answer is no, because when they're preserved in formalin and alcohol, that denatures the 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 the, the venom. And so, no, they're, they're, they're not dangerous. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. And so I think I have a few like favorite questions. I'm gonna save those a little bit for the end. Um, mm -hmm. Some of our follow-up questions for some of the animals that you highlighted today. Chris wanted to know about our salamander collection. Do we have one of the most comprehensive salamander collections in the world? Very good question. I think Chris might know uh, one of the things that we're so proud of here in North Carolina, we are the salamander state. We have more species of salamanders, now 64 species with the description of the Carolina Sandhill salamander. 64 species of salamanders in North Carolina makes us have more species of salamanders than any other U.S. state. Um, and most of that diversity is are the lungless salamanders, the family Plethodontidae. And, um, and most of that diversity is in the western part of North Carolina in the Southern Appalachians. Um, and because we have such tremendous salamander diversity, we also have significant salamander collections. Um, we have very, very strong Southeastern North Carolina and Southeastern US salamander collections. And that's especially the lungless salamanders, but we have really good representation of lots of other stuff. Um, I think I showed you, you know, we, everything from, from hellbenders to water dogs to two-line salamanders and, and so forth. Um, we also have some really important collections of some Asian salamanders. Um, and so, because some of my research um, pertains to descriptions of new species of, of newts that occur in Southeast Asia. So we do have very good salamander collections. Thank you. Okay, and then still talking about salamanders. Does the Sandhills Salamanders Range come close to the South Carolina Sandhills? Very good question. 
And so in our publication that just came out in December, that was one of the unknowns that we, we outlined for future directions. So the range of the Carolina Sandhill salamander gets to within about two miles of the South Carolina border. So it's currently, in, it's currently only known to occur within North Carolina. And there has been some survey work on the South Carolina side, and of course it hasn't turned up yet. But I believe that the species probably occurs in South Carolina, although probably only marginally. I don't think it, it gets very far in. So uh, looking for a Carolina Sandhill salamander on the South Carolina side of that border uh, is a real priority. Absolutely, very good question. Thanks. So uh, another salamander question, very appropriate everybody. Hmm. Regina wants to know, um, she says actually, I feel like I read that there are two salamander species that are only distinguish, distinguished by DNA. Which species are they? Well, that's a very good question. And there are actually a number of salamanders that um, are a, what we call a species complex uh, that are morphologically cryptic, meaning it's really hard to sort of look at them and know which species they are. So for example, our slimy salamanders, um, pl the plethodon glutinosus complex. Um, the slimy salamander complex occurs, you know, all over Eastern uh, North America but it's been divided up into you know, uh, a dozen or more species now, uh, mostly on the basis of genetics. Now there are um, diagnostic coloration and, and size features of them, but there's a lot of variation and overlap. And so most of our slimy salamanders, their geographic ranges have been determined based on genetics rather than morphology. And so if you were to bring a slimy salamander into the museum and not know wh where it came from in Eastern North America, it would be very hard for a specialist to determine which of the dozen or more species it belongs to. So knowing where it came from, uh, and then if necessary, having DNA sequence data um, are necessary. And so there are, there are actually several of these species complexes like that. I always think that's really interesting. We mm -hmm. find them in the field and we're like, well, dot, 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 it's this, but. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, so some more questions. Elena wants to know, which clades of amphibians suffer the most from stressor stressors caused by human impact? And then also, are glass lizards considered a transitional species? Uh, I didn't quite understand the first question. Could you could you repeat that? Wh what sure, are the major yeah. stressors for? Yeah, so which uh, clades of amphibians suffer the most from stressors caused by human impact? So I guess. Um, yeah, I mean, most 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 clades of amphibians have 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 uh, have, have have suffered. Um, yeah, it's it's. It and it tends to be, you know, you, you know, usually in a geographic area. You, you, you know, the destruction, you know, will tend to hit lots of different species and that they represent lots of different clades. Um, so um, as for uh, our legless lizards, our glass lizards, a transitional species, uh, no, what's interesting about when you look at um, lizard evolution, the, there has been loss of limbs, loss of legs, many, many times during the evolution of lizards. And glass lizards are just one group of lizards uh, that are now told, are, that, are, that are limbless. Um, but we see limblessness in lots of other different, different um, um, lizard groups that are unrelated. So for example, um, skinks, you know, there are lots of limbless skinks uh, and so forth, so. They do look like snakes, um, and they're confused with snakes routinely. But uh, but limblessness is is a is a is a is, is prevalent within within uh, within lizard evolution. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then skipping back to the coral snake, Heather asked, "What was the contributing factor in the species not being as widely distributed now?" So the current the current hypothesis is that it relates to climate change. Um, now, of course, this, this, I don't think coral snakes were ever very common in North Carolina. 
And, you know, of course, uh, habitat destruction has been, has been really hard on them. Um, in North Carolina, you know, they're associated with longleaf pine, fire dependent uh, ecosystem. But, um, and so, um, but, but so many other species, of course, uh, of, of reptiles uh, and amphibians have suffered likewise from the loss of longleaf pine. So that has been a major, major contributor, but why have they disappeared from areas like in the sand hills where some of those longleaf pine species still persist, although certainly um, it's much smaller populations than in the past. And the current hypothesis is climate change. Um, based on this recent research looking at climate modeling in the range of coral snakes um, in, the, in the past and the present. Uh, and it seems that, um, that the habitat, the climate has become less suitable for coral snakes in the Sandhills region um, than it was in the past. That's a current hypothesis, but there've been other contributing factors and there are other ideas. Um, you know, some people have suggested, well, fire ants have been really deleterious to coral snakes and, and they probably have, but fire, fire ants, which are an invasive species and are really, really hard on little terrestrial um, amphibians and reptiles, um, really didn't get established until what, maybe the 1980s or so. Uh, in, in the sand hills. And so they seem to have disappeared before, before that. Um, so our current hypothesis is climate change. Great. So we have just a few minutes left and I know we are, um, we also have a few more questions. Mm -hmm. Before we run out of time though, I know that you probably get this question a lot. So I thought it would be good to answer. Carissa wants to know, do you take specimen donations? We, we do, um, we do, we get, we get specimen donations um, from all kinds, from members of the public all the time, as well as, you know, other state agency partners and so forth. Um, we often, you know, we, we are interested in specimens that are, you know, still in good condition, you know, that have been, you know, have been found, you know, not things that have been collected alive, but, but things that have been found, unfortunately, you know, um, um, you know, severely injured or, 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 and to the point or, or dead uh, that are still in good condition and that have locality data because the locality data, of course, are so critically important. Um, but uh, um, so the thing to do, if you have a specimen that's in good condition that you're interested in donating uh, to the museum would be to email me. And my collection manager, Jeff Bean and I would review it and see what it is and how, what its condition is like and where it's coming from and then consider if we would take it as a donation. But thank you for thinking of this. Thank you. And we are gonna need to go ahead and wrap up. So I'm gonna have one more screen share to show you about our t-shirts. It's one of our favorite kind of celebratory things that we offer when we have reptile and amphibian days. And so I'm going to see, give me just a moment, share this last thank you slide with all of you. We're so glad again that you could join us today for our kickoff event for reptile and amphibian days, our week long adventure into the world of herpetology. Thank you so much, Brian, for giving us the behind the scenes tour of the collection. And I will keep my fingers crossed that um, perhaps a personal tour um, will be available sometime in the far, far future, but um, you all can stay tuned for information like that. And one of the best ways for you to stay tuned is to join the museum and become a friend of the museum or renew your membership. And you will learn more about these kinds of opportunities. You can order your Reptile and Amphibian Day t-shirt at the store.naturalsciences.org. Museum members will get one for free. This actually is one of our favorite designs too, by the way. And Brian, as we are wrapping up and thank you everybody for joining, can you tell us um, one of your favorite reptiles and amphibians that you've ever found in the field as we say goodbye to everyone? Can you pick oh just gosh, one? so many, but I, I mean, I, I'd have to say, you know, like that cardamom Sicilian was a real thrill to be able to see that just because they're so poorly known. Um, but um, so many favorites, so many favorites. So we encourage you all to get outside and listen and look for 
reptile and amphibian discoveries of your own and, and take pictures and, and share your findings with the museum if you want to. And again, we're so thankful that you were able to join us today. And thank you so much for, for supporting the museum and supporting reptiles and amphibians of North Carolina and the world. Have a great rest of your day, everybody. Thank you.